the seduction of Kelly Slater. In 1989, Kelly Slater was a junior at Cocoa Beach High School when Surfer Magazine sent you down to write a profile on him. I would love to hear about that experience. And also, what was your awareness of Kelly prior to writing that article? And how did that meeting go? Okay, that's interesting. This was in the era of, of, of the magazines. And this is when you know, they would literally, they would give me an envelope with some money in it and a ticket and going, okay, Matt, you're going to go cover the Australian season, say, you, we'll see in three months, just write about whatever you want to write about, find your stories, do your things, you know, be around the contest. And so I became a commentator, you know, I was, I was the American voice, you know, at these foreign surf contests. And of course, in America, I'm sure um, you might be aware that, you know, Sam's in my commentary at the at the early contests, you know, we were, you know, we were an institution really. But anyway, um, I had, I had been around and lived with, literally lived with uh, a prodigy, you know, a, a Messiah in Tom Curran. And so I knew, I, I knew when someone was going to be a, a, a world champion, when I saw them surf, first time I saw Tom Curran surf at Rincon on a twin fin, I, I just, I, I literally looked at Sam and said, well, he's going to be uh, his first wave. I looked at Sam and said, well, he's going to be a world champion. And Sam said, yeah, I know it's obvious. And so it was the same thing with Kelly. When I first saw footage of him or, or, or just the way that his, the way he moved, you know, to me, Tom Kern was a Barishnikov and Kelly Slater was a young Nuriev, you know, to me. And I, I, I became fascinated with this guy's ergonomics, the, the way that he moved, you know, the way Kelly moved on a wave really interested me. And then when I found out he came from a very humble background, I became very interested in his story. He had a single parent, he had a close brother, you know, and I'm like, okay, this is going to be a great story. So Surfer Magazine flew me back there. And these are in the days when, you know, you flew journalists to places and, and they embedded themselves. And my I had a five day rule at Surfer Magazine. I said, I will not do an assignment unless I can live with this person for five days minimum. I will not meet them in a cafe and talk to them for an hour and turn off my little recording machine and do a story. I'm not going to do it. I want to know their mother's maiden name. I want to know what they eat for breakfast. I want to know what they think, you know, and I want to see them because I wasn't particularly interested in what surfers were going to say. I was more interested in what they weren't saying. That's what interested me. What is this person not saying? That's what really interested me. And so I was really pleased when, when I got to um, Cocoa Beach and realized the similarities uh, between us, basically, you know, the single, the single parent family uh, living it by humble means, um, you know, Kelly and I, you know, bunked down in the same mattress on the floor where his mother was struggling to raise three boys. And I was just so pleased when my first impression with Kelly Slater was his intelligence. He was a very bright young man. And um, that was just so refreshing. And it really um, it really distinguished him from the people around him. He didn't even talk like an East Coast or like, hey, y'all, let's go get some Yoo-Hoo. You know, it wasn't that at all. He, he, he spoke in a very erudite way and he was very eloquent about surfing. And so it was, it was a, 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 a wonderful experience and a, and a bonding experience between us both. And that's when our, you know, our lifetime friendship began. What inspired the title of that piece? The seduction of Kelly Slater. I that's easy. And that's what that's what caused all the problems, you know, because it opens up with me. And, you know, I, I, I've i proudly in my entire career said, well, I'm the only guy I know that slept with Kelly Slater, you know, and it's it's a joke. It's a fun joke. And it's a fun gag because that opening line of in that story of uh, the opening line was he sleeps like an angel. And I wrote the I wrote the uh, whole story from the perspective of me sleeping next to this young man on the same mattress underneath a moving blanket, you know, uh, you know, a, a moving company blanket. That's how these people were living uh, mattresses on the floor. And and it was just such a, 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 a something I could really relate to because I was raised in a room with four boys, you know, growing up. 
and yeah. um with our when when our family became blended but anyway it was perfectly natural to me i i had no idea the reaction that people were going to get from that and it was it was a, a a very startling um it was a very startling homophobic reaction from surfer magazine where a certain editor changed it to where i was not in bed with him but i was actually watching him sleep from the doorway late at night and i find that infinitely more creepy and you know his mother even called me and said if i knew you were wandering around the house at night watching us sleep i never would have let you through the threshold and i'm like please mrs slater that's not what that isn't true i had to send her my original story and go please please and so we became friends again but i she was gonna like have me arrested or something so i thought that was a really bad move on on surfer's part but at any rate um the seduction of Kelly Slater and that title came to me because he was being courted at that time by everybody and he was having money thrown at him and they this was back when you weren't allowed to get money uh, it didn't happen till the next year and you had to stay amateur and his his closet looked like a traveling salesman sample rack and they still had you know, the little uh, price tags on everything from every single surf company in the world and more. There was products showing up every day on, you know, Instamatic cameras and all this kind of stuff showing up out of nowhere. And it was really overwhelming. And he had, you know, a sticker on his board the size of a dinner plate. And, you know, it was just like, you know, this kid was being seduced by all this. And it was, it was, it was so astonishing to me that he had such command of it at such an early age um because it, it yes he was being seduced but he really seduced the world in in the opposite direction uh he, he was like a courtesan he was like a great you know a great a great geisha or something you know that even though you know they're supposed to do you know they're, they're the ones that are apparently in um you know servitude when in fact they're the ones in command and kelly was in command of his career at a very early age thanks to his mother just like tom curran whose dedicated mother drove him up and down a coast you know up and down the california coast for tommy and the east coast for kelly and a dedicated mom that got him to these contests and believed in him and both mothers were not about money that was something because both mothers came from such a humble background. It, it was that that was something really neat, you know, that I realized these mothers, these mothers drove these young men up and down the coast, these contests, because they realized that they they had given birth to prodigies. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you asked Kelly in that interview was what he would do if he had a lot of money one day. Mm -hmm. And his answer was maybe build a wave pool for me and my friends. Yes. And I'll never forget that moment because Kelly and I had long conversations about wave pools and I was really into artificial waves. Then I, I just, I still am. I'm a huge fan of wave pools and artificial waves. And those early days in Alameda, I used to go down to the little beach there. Cause you know, it was an Island inside the Bay and I would go to the garbage cans and I'd get soda cans like Coke cans and stuff. And I'd fill it with sand. I'd, I'd make little artificial reefs and I'd make little six inch to eight inch, you know, six inch to one foot, you know, literally 12 inch little waves. And I'd make rights and lefts. And, you know, I, I, I created these little things and, and I was really into it. And so um, when Kelly said that, I said, yeah. And, and we got into this big conversation about how neat a wave pool would be and how cool it was. And we actually ran down to the beach because it was low tide. And, and I showed him how to fill the Coke cans. And we went in the shallows and started trying to make a wave. And uh, no, I don't know why I didn't write about that. And that's when I shot that the famous photograph of him. We were uh, a shrimp boat had washed ashore. And after we tired of, of playing in the shore break, we we climbed up on this uh we climbed up on this shrimp boat and uh, that's when I shot that incredible photo that was supposed to go with the feature. Uh, it's featured in the book, of course. Um, and uh, that, 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 that's when I shot that photo. So that was remarkable when, when he said that we had no idea that someday he would uh, change, change the entire surfing world with a wave pool. But back then it really sparked, um, it sparked a common interest in us. And I remember the exact moment when he said it. 
And I have to tell you, David, when he said it, I believed him. I believe I believe this was the guy that was finally going to bring it, you know, because, you know, I I grew up with, you know, seeing images of um, the big surf wave pool in Tempe, Arizona, and these these incredible exotic looking places in Japan. And as you and I both know, the waves were never right, you know, and then um, and then Kelly went on to indeed build a wave pool for him and his friends. Yeah, no kidding.